Jenkins, and I'm the lead of the Portland, Greater Portland Conscious Capitalism chapter. And the chapter has been around for about two years now. And if you, it's your first time joining us, we're so happy that you're here. Um, we've recently started more publicly promoting our events. And so lots of people have been here for us for the whole time and some new people are joining sometimes out of curiosity or basically because they, they're really interested in the presenter. So Neil's a big draw today because we have a big group um, joining us. And so we're really excited about that. And if you're interested in learning more about our events or joining our mailing list, you can go to the Portland Conscious Capitalism website. We'll put that in the chat at the end and you can look at our different events going forward and you can also sign up for our mailing list to get that more actively directly in your inbox. So thank you again for joining us. And I think you all know that the, really the, the topic today is really talking about what it, what it takes to become a B Corp and the, the most recent B Corp um, organization, Andrew Scrogg and Bank and their CEO, Neil Kiley here with us to talk about that. And we're gonna talk about everything from conscious leadership to what that certification process was like and Neil's decision-making and, and learn about Andrew Scrogg and Bank along the way as well, which will be super exciting. Just a housekeeping item, because I think you're probably all familiar that with groups this size and the size that this will eventually be as more people join, that the chat function can sometimes get a little bit out of control. So we'd really like uh, you to hold your chat until we specifically ask for questions, because otherwise what we find is that people will have too hard a time paying attention to what Neil is saying, which will be super important, um, at the same time as reading what people are writing in the chat. So if that's okay with everybody as a ground rule, um, we'll ask you to actively go into the chat, but otherwise we use it pretty sparingly so that we can all focus and be community together. Anyone have any concerns about that? Okay, great. Well, we're gonna start off our session with some context setting. Um, to just really find out from Neil, in, in absence or in replacement of me doing a formal introduction of his bio, we're actually going to have Neil give us whatever he selects to tell about his background by really talking to us, Neil, about your path to becoming the CEO of a B Corp certified bank. So kind of give us some context as to how we got here together with you and, and why that Thank you very much, Tara. I'm really excited to be here with everybody. And I'll, I'll just, the short answer was a very unconventional path. Uh, I will say it's a, a combination of influences and experiences across my entire career. You know, under the heading of influences, I'd point out, you know, having exposure to kind of two seminal books. One was John Mackey's Be the Solution. Of course, he's the founder of Whole Foods. And the second one is Yvonne Chouinard's Let My People Go Surfing. Uh, he's the founder of Patagonia. And, you know, those two books, which I read years ago, kind of laid out the, the central tenets for conscious capitalism or multi-stakeholder capitalism. You know, essentially the idea that companies should think about organizing around serving multiple stakeholders instead of just shareholders and focus on creating value for all of those stakeholders instead of just financial outcomes or results, uh, which all resonated with me. But a, a couple of things resonated even more deeply. One is that although they talk about elevating employees to level of stakeholders, which was kind of radical, they actually go a step further and recognize that not only are employees worthy of value creation efforts, but they're also, they, they have two roles because they also are the drivers for creating value for all the other stakeholders. So maybe they're first among equals, I think which made sense to me. And in terms of the leadership principles that they kind of outlined in order to run a company this way, the first one was this kind of deep care for your stakeholders, right? You have to have a deep care and passion and empathy for all of your stakeholders. And then beyond that, it's all about trust building. So, you know, from my experience in early in my career as an employee, that kind of culture and that approach resonated with me. But especially when I became a business owner and running my own companies and kind of building my own cultures, did it really profoundly resonate with me. I think my experience for other business owners on the phone will share this. And in Maine, people don't start companies just to make money. They start because they have a passion and they want to serve others. They don't look at employees as labor input, right? And we know that they're the backbone of philanthropy and service in our communities. And we saw both of those exemplified during the pandemic, we saw CEOs and leaders and business owners go to great lengths for their employees and to support the communities. So this all was really intuitive to me. Uh, later in life, I had the kind of unique experience of going back to be an employee again after having run my own companies. And I landed in a renewable energy company uh, fortuitously, and I was surrounded by, I would say, passionate purpose-driven colleagues. 
and it was an incredible uh, environment. And to be part of that was incredibly fulfilling and oftentimes fun. Although candidly, it was, you know, they stretched my capabilities because they set the bar so high. So I had that experience as an employee, but I also, as a former business owner, watched the output. And I saw what these teams were able to do that was staggering and compared to our competition. So I had all of this kind of, you know, kind of, I guess, um, rumbling around. And then in 2013, I had a kind of a, a personal experience. We had a, a house fire, uh, which is a traumatic experience. There's no way to kind of describe it any other way. But uh, it was also, you know, an experience my wife and I was the first time that we'd have been on the receiving end. I don't say necessarily of charity, but of service. Right? We had this invisible safety net of family and friends and neighbors and strangers come out and hold our family. And uh, it was a profound experience, I think, for, for, for both of us. But for me particularly, it really distilled out what was important to me and helped me reprioritize what I want to do with my life and my gifts and capabilities going forward. So fast forward, you know, about two years later, I, I had joined the board of the bank. I'm not a lifelong banker, which is somewhat unconventional. And uh, the former CEO, Paul Anderson, uh, took me aside one day and said, I have this crazy idea. What would you think about stepping off the board into management and helping me lead a transformation of the bank to reposition us, you know, to make sure we stay relevant in the midst of all this change that's happening in our industry? Um, and it was a no-brainer for me. You know, two reasons. I saw it as a unique opportunity. First, to be part of building a company and a culture that I would have wanted to work at, at every stage of my own career. And two, to kind of put all these principles and practice, you know, practices into practice, if you will, I'm sorry, um, to demonstrate you can not only survive running this model, you can actually thrive, right? And so, you know, I guess five years later, sitting here, B Corp certified is the culmination of this very kind of long journey that started years ago uh, and made a non-banker into a banker as an opportunity to kind of pursue this model. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That's such a great explanation. And so you talked about five years ago. Um, so you've been at the bank for five years. Is that correct? Yeah, I joined it. I joined it, came inside in 2015. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is a perfect time to talk about then the work that you, you did to sort of pave the path to becoming a certified B Corp. Like what were you doing to build that foundation before you went for the certification? You know, that's a great question. I know there's a lot of folks on the phone today that want to know what's involved in the process. And I don't want to give the mistaken impression that we decided to become B Corp certified and flick the switch and they mailed the certification. There was a lot of foundational work that went into this. Again, when I came in, I was, you know, the first title was chief strategy officer. And the, kind of, the idea was, how are we going to stay relevant? And we looked at what was happening in the industry and we, we came to the conclusion, the only thing that was guaranteed not to change in our industry is that our clients would always be human beings. And the only thing we know they, they would continue to value is relationships. And we also realized that, you know, clients don't have relationships with a company or a bank. They have relationships with other human beings, namely employees. So we asked ourselves the question is like, how can we set out to try and attract and retain the best possible employees out there and then kind of set them up and empower them to kind of build these deep relationships and create value for these, for our clients. And the answer we got was, you know, it comes down to culture. And so the question becomes, well, in every small business, people kind of build culture naturally. It's an extension of the business owner. It happens organically. But when you have 187 employees in multiple locations in a financial institution that's been around for 150 years, it's a whole different ball of wax. You have to be really intentional about it. So, you know, part of our learning was, well, it really comes down to this framework of mission, vision, values. You know, why do you exist? You know, what's the meaningfulness of your work? Where are you going? What does success look like? And how do you agree to act along the way? So part of the foundation for us was running this grassroots process with our employees. You know, we actually engaged representatives from across the bank and then we did focus groups to kind of craft the answers to these questions. And once we arrived at consensus, we all looked at each other and said, yes, this is it. We turned to kind of rebuilding the bank itself from the foundations to say, okay, if we, we embrace multiple stakeholders, our clients, our employees and our communities, how are we going to deliver value creation at the highest levels of excellence? And so we, you know, we've rebuilt our technology. We've hired people. We've, we've done all kinds of change and transformation in the bank. But as part of that, we were continually trying to embed our mission, vision, values into the bank itself. So for one, one example is that we thought about our employee, the value to offer our employees and the culture we want to build. You know, we thought about all the things that our employees worry about outside of work, right? All the anxieties. And so we said, you know, one, we want to start with we want to pay, make sure we're paying a, a living wage as benchmarked against the MIT index by geography. 
Two, we want to build a package or portfolio of benefits to address all of those potential anxieties. So for example, um, you know, how do we take care of the, the medical needs of our families, the mental health needs of our families? What happens if we have a child while we're working? How do we pay for our own college education? How do we you know, um, prepare for retirement? And so we, you know, if we try to do all of that in the first year, it would have been beyond our resources, but we had a plan and we layered those in over time. Uh, and as a result, when we you know, turned to the B-Lab questionnaire and they asked, do you pay a living wage? We could say with confidence, yes. And when they asked what type of benefit package, we could you know, proudly say, this is our benefit package. And we know benchmarked against industry, it's, you know, it's a leading package. And we could actually then look beyond it. The next question is, well, what are your participation levels? You know, and we could demonstrate that. So there's a lot of foundational work uh, that happened over those three years before we made the decision uh, to pursue the certification. I love those practical examples that you just gave, um, you know, because mission, vision, and values is something that a lot of companies have, and sometimes just on paper or maybe just on the website, but haven't embedded them into the organization and activated them in very real ways. So it's really helpful to hear the specific examples of that, and perhaps you'll get some more questions at the end about that. I, I want to mention to the participants that I, Neil and I have a series of stuff that, you know, questions we're going to go through and then we'll, there will be time at the end for you to ask questions. So don't worry, um, keep holding those questions and we'll have some time at the end. But you just really teed up, uh, Neil, in a great way, us talking about what made you decide after that three year period of time where you were laying all that foundation in place to go for being a certified B Corp as a bank. So it really, I think, came down to three reasons. The first one was that we had been doing this work, we, we'd been doing it in a silo, and we felt we were making progress, but we really wanted to benchmark ourselves against like-minded companies to see if our actions met our intentions. So the idea of kind of testing our assumptions, and two, the opportunity to say, if there were gaps, to have access to this community of other companies that we could trade best practices with. So that was one reason, you know, I thought we were, we were ready to at least test ourselves. The second reason I think is real driver for us, and that is that we, in that short time, we noticed that the quality and the nature of the, people, of the employees we had, you know, purpose-driven, really passionate, had already started to differentiate us in the marketplace. It was having a profound impact. And we want to ensure that we'd be able to continue to retain those folks and attract similar folks going forward. And at the same time, the people that have gone down this journey with us, the people that stayed at the bank, you know, uh, when we went down this path, and the people that joined us along the way, really did, did so with the understanding of being part of this kind of journey of vision that we had laid out. And I felt at that time, you know, we owed it to them to kind of ensure that we were making a full commitment to stay on this path. I didn't want them to wake up one day and I get hit by a truck or the board turned over to learn that the, the bank decided to go down a different path. I didn't think that would be equitable. So making that commitment to our existing employees and the future employees that we're gonna go down this path by embracing the certification. And then as you know, Tara, there's a second step where we have to uh, actually change our legal documentation to become a benefit corporation. So literally embedding this into our legal DNA, you know, is the, an execution of the commitment to our employees. And lastly, you know, the third reason was, you know, even before COVID hit, we noticed that there was this growing sentiment among community employees, et cetera, that they wanted uh, businesses to do more. Right? They wanted companies to focus on bigger, solving bigger problems than just making a profit. Uh, some observers noticed that perhaps people have lost a little faith in government to solve some of the bigger societal problems. And while our nonprofits do heroic work, you know, they're often under-resourced. And I think COVID just accelerated this kind of sentiment dramatically where people came out around certain issues and said, you know what, we want companies to fill this, step in and fill this gap. You know, Take all the energy, the talent, the capabilities, the innovation, strategic thinking you have and lend it to, you know, beyond making a dollar, apply it to more stakeholders and to other problems. And so even before it hit, we said this was, you know, our way of kind of signaling that we were ready to answer that call. And so those are the, the, the three primary drivers. And, and Neil, could you give us a little bit of uh, color about as a bank being a certified B Corp, what, what does that mean differently about the way that you operate day to day? Like, what, what would you say are some specific examples about if you, people are used to a banking experience with their bank, who is most likely not a certified B Corp, unless they're with Andrew Scott right. or Soma, um, what, what would you say is different about the customer experience? 
you know, I well, I'll say what I hope is different about what our what we found, and I'll say the certification really layered on the work that we've done for the last couple of years, right? You know, it's this idea, this orientation that we are here to create value for our stakeholders, that clients are a stakeholder, employees are a stakeholder, and communities are a stakeholder, and that we truly put their interests first. So we're never negotiating against a client, right? We're balancing interests. You know, we're a mutual bank. You know, think about it. Our, our depositors want the highest interest possible. Our, our borrowers want the lowest interest possible, right? And so we have to kind of structure that to balance between the two and earn enough profit to kind of take care of our employees give back to our community. So there's no, there's no person behind the veil. There's no alternative motive, right? All our interests are aligned. Um, our, as a mutual, essentially our depositors essentially own the bank and we kind of, you know, we, we treat them that way. So it's really a different in attitude and perspective. The other real difference I think is the quality and the nature of the employees, which drives the client experience. And I think that's what we've seen. That really is, offers them the biggest differentiation. If you have highly passionate, engaged employees who are here because they want to be a service. They want to have meaningful work. Uh, that's the biggest differentiator, I think, that you'll find. And I think it's the old, you know the piece is, you know, people can take have confidence that we take great care of our employees, and that, you know, we have local decision makers. We are part and parcel of our community. We saw that through PPP, right? We answered the phone when other folks were having trouble getting through so to some of the larger institutions, perhaps, um, and we lend through the cycle. Right. So I think it's really just a commitment of who we are and they have confidence in now the transparency and the accountability. It, you know, it's more of like, show me, not t don't tell me, you know, yeah. we have to back it up with this recertification every three years. Uh, so that's probably the biggest difference. Thank you. That's so helpful. But I, why I love what you highlighted is the, the mutual bank aspect, not not being familiar with the banking, banking industry myself over the course of my career and learning about that relatively recently is a real distinction and I think the way that um, we can think about banks as customers. So I, I'm glad that you highlighted that. And if it's something that audience you're not familiar with, you'll have time to ask a little more questions about that, but it's interesting model um, that I just wasn't aware of. So thank you for sharing that, Neil. And so here's a, a sort of reflection question around what did you learn about the B Corp process that surprised you while you're going through it? And maybe at the same, same time, kind of what did you wish you know uh, you, what do you know now that you wished you knew then when you sort of embarked on that as people are considering it or interested in learning more about it? So, you know, I knew about the B Corp uh, certification for a number of years. And that was always in the back of my mind, you know, as an aspiration, a goal um, personally and with the company. I didn't know much about the process. So, for example, you know, and I'll just I'll kind of share some of this for the folks on the phone. You know, there's a there's a 200 question survey that you take across five areas. And it basically comes down to how well do you treat your employees, your clients? How do you engage with your community? Uh, you know, what are your practices around sustainability or your environmental footprint? And what are your practices around governance and transparency? Uh, and the first learning is that nobody can hit all 200, right? The, the questions are geared to different industries. So that's, it's tailored, I didn't know that, but nobody can hit the 200 and that's okay. You need to have a score of 80 as a threshold. The individual questions are weighted differently. Right, which I also didn't know. I think most surprisingly, I also didn't know that um, the questions can change. So when we go to recertify in three years, those questions will be different. So in one sense, it's a little disconcerting the goalposts can move. At the some same time, I think it underscores the authenticity and the integrity of the process because they don't want you to kind of teach to the test, if you will, or kind of study for the test. They want you to do the right thing um, and that should show up in the questions. The other thing I didn't know is that you can kind of, you can take the survey before you formally go through the process. So you can take the survey and see how you score and then determine, you know, what are our gaps and are we close? And I'll, I'll just share that, you know, the two executives that led this effort in our team, Michelle Love and Jeff Smith, took a, I thought was a great approach. When they answered a question, they said, if we were in a court of law, could we put our hand up and swear, yes, that we do this? And two, could we also demonstrate that we do it? And if they couldn't answer yes, they wouldn't give themselves credit for that question, right? So I think that was, and then you can see at the end, if you score with a certain buffer, then you feel that you'll have some point. If you lose some points during the validation process, you'll still be okay. That was the other learning. We get audited by numerous orders, federal regulators, state regulators on a yearly basis. They alternate. We have financial uh, regulate, uh, auditors and all kinds of specialized auditors. So we have a lot of experience being audited to answer these type of surveys. This was rigorous by any standard, right? They are serious about protecting the integrity of the certification. Uh, so you answer the questions. Once you formally go through the process, you answer the questions, and then they come back and they ask follow-up questions 
And then again, another, there could be another round of questions and then validation, can you document it all? So all of those I think are on the process. The, on the positive side of the learnings, you know, you, you're head down, you go into this process, you're answering questions and you're like, are we gonna make it, et cetera. And then suddenly when you get the letter that you've made it, they open the doors wide and they just expose you to this incredible community and all of these resources. It's just, you know, they call it the beehive um, at the national level. And there are teams and committees and forums from all different companies trading ideas and the excitement is great. And the content is phenomenal. Then there's a regional uh, organization in Boston. And then here in, you know, in Portland and Maine, there's about, I think 10 or 11 uh, B Corp certified companies that have a, a new community and you know the quality of the people there the engagement the enthusiasm is fantastic so that was a, a surprise to me a pleasant surprise another one I think would say is that the the value of the certification is less about the certification itself it's more about B Corp as an organizing principle as a framework to explain to your employees your clients and others what you're doing uh, and to plan your work and your resources and to kind of fill gaps so it really helpful there. And I'd say that the biggest value that I didn't realize at the time is that this approach requires you to be incredibly intentional about every aspect of your business. You know, every decision you make, you have to weigh out the implications on multiple stakeholders. And as you think about making improvements across your company, you have to layer out resources. And of course, you have to wrap it all in you know, financial discipline. And I think that because it demands such a level of intentionality, necessarily will take elevate you in terms of excellence. And that's going to come through in the client experience, the client value creation, employee experience, community, et cetera. So these were all pluses. I knew the certification had value at the, at the first level to validate, you know, we're, we're doing what we try to accomplish and to learn. I didn't re recognize the full value as an organizing principle and this, you know, this commands for or demands in terms of intentionality. So those are the things I think the things I would, the learnings I had, I took away from the process. Thank you. I love how you described um, the, those that were working on the certification as going through the business impact assessment and, and sort of putting up their hands <laughs> in the court of law and, and then saying, like, could we prove it? Um, because my experience in working with clients that are considering this, or I'll just suggest that they're go they go do the BIA, they'll come back and say, oh, I, I scored it. We scored a 70. And I'll be like, hmm. <laughs> like, I, so I'm going to use that and say, like, could you put your hand up and swear at a court of law? And then how would you show that? Because they're going to, like, seriously ask you to show how you're doing that. It's not just like that you think you are or that you pretend to do it or whatever it is. It's like you have to show it. It has to be written down somewhere in order to, to demonstrate that. So that's a great, great uh, way to, to really hold yourself authentic and true to what they're asking you to do. Well, I'll, I'll just share too briefly is that, the, you know, kudos because uh, Michelle and Jeff that went through this process, Michelle was familiar with B Corp. She actually done um, some, her MBA, I think thesis on B Corp certification. So she was an enthusiastic supporter. Jeff had not been exposed to it at all. And, and I think when the, when the pandemic hit, we naturally said, should we pause this or stop? You know, and Jeff, even though he had not been exposed to it, they're both like, no, we shouldn't. You know, we saw, I think we saw, we saw the pandemic unfold is that this was more pressing in the need. And so a special thank you to them. And there were other folks on the team. This was a plus one job. It wasn't an official project from finance and other, other places in the bank that just did this you know, on their own, I just say their own time, but in addition to all their other duties mm. because they were compelled, uh, you know, so passionate about it. So I can't thank them enough. Yeah, that's really important to call out. And, and another really important group would be your board. So you, you mentioned, you know, doing the B Corp certification in and of itself is a big um, impact on resources, both from people and financial, and there's, you know, board sponsorship typically involved with that, but also there is a legal factor in changing to a benefit corporation. And so tell us a little bit about how did you approach your board with this, because that can be an obstacle for leaders who feel very motivated to do this, but then have to get a board on board, so to speak, with, <laughs> with this initiative. So yes, well, I, you know, it's interesting because the foundational um, discussion around this didn't happen at the time of the B Corp certification recently. That foundational discussion happened a couple of years ago. We talked about becoming a mission-driven values-based company. And the two dimensions there, the first was, well, what are the constraints of being a values-based company? And I remember saying to the board, it's like, I don't know how this will constrain us, but it will constrain us. We have to be thoughtful about that. Um, and that, you know, that was one piece. And the second piece was about the role of, of profitability and finance. And I think because although this, you know, we have, our board is great and we have business owners on there. And I think it, it 
again, with them, just like with me, it resonates. Like, this makes complete sense. But to your point, you know, as a fiduciary, they have a fiduciary obligation as a director of a financial institution, which is, which profit matters. In a sense, we, we are mutual banks, so we don't have shareholders. However, the corollary of that is we can't go to the public markets to access capital. So we can only grow out of earnings. We can only invest for the future out of earnings. So profits are really important. And believe me, profits are incredibly important to our regulators. So that, you know, that was a, a key issue. And I think there, this is where the, we talked a little about this, Tara, before that the sound bite of purpose over profits is really not helpful to the conversation because it reinforces this idea that the pie of value is fixed. And that if we invest an extra dollar in benefits for our employees, that's an extra dollar that comes out of the pocket of the bank's earnings or what we can do for our, our clients. And instead you have to look at it with a kind of a growth mindset to say that, you know, this is the discussion we have with the board is that we believe that if we go forward and focus on creating value for all these stakeholders and over time, and we run our business with operational excellence and financial discipline, we can grow the pie for everybody, right? And, and but they, at, at that point in time, the board had to take a leap of faith. Now, so when we, you know, fast forward, we sat down and talked to them about certification. We had gone over that threshold and they had a couple of years to see the results. You know, they had seen our employee engagement scores go up dramatically, followed by our client satisfaction scores. They had seen the fact that, you know, we were recruiting eight out of 10 of our employees were recruited by other employees, which is a powerful, powerful endorsement of the culture. But it's also a competitive advantage when people come to you pre-qualified for character, cultural fit and performance, because they've been recommended by somebody in the bank. They saw the testimonials and the referrals go through the roof from our clients. So th they, they felt comfortable on the model but the question is exactly what you raised. And okay, well, well, actually one of the best questions was, is B-Lab's kind of lens on mission, vision, values and what's important consistent with what ours is? Or are, is that gonna constrain us from doing the right thing? That was a great question. Uh, the next question though is like, well, what happens if we lose certification? What's the implication? It's a, it's a real concern. And then of course the legal, the legal implications of changing our corporate documents after 150 years um, and so those are all good dialogue, I think. But ultimately, I think what carried us through is, you know, I pointed out to the board, I said, you know, when we asked them to make that foundational decision three or four years ago, they had to take a, a courageous leap of faith because there was no local company that I could point to that I could say they did this. That's not to say there was not a local company that was operating that way. I, I was not aware of it, you know, full disclosure. I said, so imagine if the next company or board is wrestling with this and they can point to us and as a financial institution that nobody can say, well, they don't care about profitability or financial outcomes. And I was helped in this regard because although there was no one around a few years ago to point to, when it came to B Corp certification, we were able to point to our friends at Mascoma Bank over in New Hampshire, Clay Adams, the CEO over there, and Todd Batchelder, who's the uh, commercial lender here in town, who got certified a couple of years ago, which was really compelling to our board. Because like, okay, they, they navigated all the regulatory questions that we would have. Uh, and they, in the, in the best B Corp spirit, they were really forthcoming and sharing their experience with us, which I was able to share with the board. So this idea of like, hey, what kind of impact can we have if we can kind of be a model for other companies? And if other companies kind of emulate this model, like ours and other B Corps, then their employees benefit, their clients benefit, and the, our entire main community benefits. And I think that's really what, you know, brought the, the board um, into consensus, although, you know, they're really there with us. Uh, and we have their kind of full, you know, unbridled support at this point. So important um, to consider for leaders considering this path or, or getting more curious about it, that you, you have emphasized continuously the importance of that foundation that you laid in advance of introducing B Corp certification and that you'd proven that it was working so it wasn't like you had to talk the board into anything at the point that you went into this, you know, bigger process. There was sounds like some really meaningful and important questions to, to consider strategically, right. but that you weren't caught in, in the trying to talk anybody into anything mode. It was more of a, a business decision making, you know, legitimate business decision making, which is what I, I would hope for every leader is the position they're in. I, I think so. And I think especially in here in Maine, I think, pe you know, people are receptive to this pro because, it, again, it just. It resonates, right? Who doesn't want to work in a great culture? And who doesn't think that a great culture is going to deliver, you know, better results for clients? And that, you know, clients in turn are going to, go, you know, enter a deeper relationship with you and then send their friends in referrals, right? It's very common sense, but it's, 
it's different from kind of the narrative we've had out there, the Milton Friedman approach about you know shareholder primacy, and uh, and so it is a it's a thoughtful decision for businesses, or, you know, or people or partners in a business to make. There's no doubt. And so you probably, based on all the wonderful things you shared, and you'll have a number of people on here considering whether they might want to go for it, or or considering how they might create the path as a foundation, as you've described, to eventually, as you said, you had it in your head for a period of time, and then then there seemed to be that moment where it made sense. So what advice would you give the folks that are considering it on this call? I think the first advice, and I'm sure that doesn't apply to anybody in this call, but I would, I would just caution, do this for the right reasons, you know, do it for authenticity. I think we've seen in the past, you hear the terms greenwashing or pinkwashing where folks, you know, do window dressing or take efforts in a, in a sense to try and fool people that they're actually kind of um, embracing these issues. And I think that if, you know, I would want, I would want, caution anybody that heard my explanation about the pie and say, well, this is actually a great way to make more money. So let's go down it for that reason, because I regret to tell you it won't work, right? Because at the, at the foundation of this, this is really with your employees, especially is that, you know, you've got to be authentically committed to it. Uh, and if you're not, they're, they're way too smart and they'll know it. So it's not going to work. I think beyond that, it's, you know, with your eyes wide open, we described this process. It's, a, it's about building a foundation it is challenging, there's no doubt. It's also immensely rewarding. So I think with your eyes wide open, I'd also say just most importantly too, is you know, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, my goodness, I'm like, my, my, I have a younger company or I don't have these resources or I'm you know, post COVID, I'm just trying to keep my head above water. You know, I don't wanna set the idea that, that um, B Corp certification is the only path. Right, and the only standard that you know to, to access this kind of approach. There, are, first of all, there are other certifications out there, or there are other measures that you can report out, report out on, um, that you can look at. And whether B Corp's the gold standard or not, it, it is one standard. You know, it's one. It's a rigorous standard we chose to to pursue, obviously. But secondly, even if you can't meet that standard now or in the immediate future, I wouldn't let that deter you from walking the path. And thinking about these issues, and I think you know this is a great place. This chapter, you know, which I've been in from the beginning, I think, um, is a great way to get access. I've done. I know Tara. I've actually participated in some of your webinars to you know to learn a, you you know, have, your perspective, yeah. which is great because you always <laughs> want to keep learning. Uh, and to hear we you know people like um, Kevin Hancock speak and other other leaders doing this work, and we're all kind of plowing the ground for the first time. Uh, so there's there's a lot of folks and resources around here to kind of start down the path. So I wouldn't say, well, if I can't do that, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to start down the path. That's probably the biggest thing. And then ask for help, right? That's the other piece, you know, the spirit of what Mascoma did for us is I'm happy to do for others. If you have to have a conversation with a board or a partner, an investor, and, you know, you want to bounce somebody off, you know, bounce it off somebody, you know, this is Maine, you know, pick up the phone and ask somebody, you know, that would be, that would be my advice. I will say, I will say though, coming on the other side of this, not just the certification, but you know, I think my experience is deeply fulfilling to me, and what's been reflected back to our by our employees is that um, the certification is another milestone on a journey that is meaningful to them and fulfilling to them to be part of that culture. And there's no better feeling, I think, to be part of a community like this. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Neil. So before we turn it over to everyone for questions, one, one last question just to, to help us get future oriented is what's next for Andrew Scoggin Bank? Like, what are you planning as the next thing you're going to lead the bank through? So I, I think, you know, in the short term, it really is, uh, you know, three things. First, we're, we're looking to make sure that we match, uh, again, our commitments with resources. So we're in the, we're in the process of recruiting for a director of corporate um, impact, which I know hopefully folks have seen the link, if not look it up and we're getting some great resumes, but if you know of anyone, please send them our way. And part of the, that person's responsibility will be the next phase of study, you know, helping to set up our B team structure. You know, part of the B Corp philosophy is that you organize your employees into teams to kind of focus on looking at your scores and certain, uh, certain of these pillars and then how you get better. Uh, so that will be one kind of major effort and how we, you know, we incorporate B Corp certification into everything we do. The next thing we'll look at over the course of this year is, you know, we're going to go back and revisit our mission, vision, values. Um, not necessarily light a B Corp, the B Corp changes it, but to say it's just another milestone to say we've been living these for a few years. Do they still resonate? Do they still make sense? Do we have more clarity that we want to incorporate? Uh, we may not change a word, 
But we found what was really powerful the first time was going through this with all of our employees, this grassroots efforts. We've had a number of folks have joined us. So being able to bring their voices into that and get more clarity about it will be really important. And the third thing we're working about is, is thinking about is like, you know, what is our particular social value proposition or social impact that we want to strive to achieve? And, you know, the, the kind of the, the best thought leadership I'm seeing around this is that, you know, try to identify things that are within your wheelhouse and align with your, your business strategy to have the biggest impact. So for example, I have a background in renewable energy. We have some folks in the bank I know that are passionate about that. And we will have a team that's focused on sustainability. We are you know, working right now to purchase our, you know, uh, solar energy from a local uh, main solar farm. That's one example. And then beyond what we do in the bank, we'll look to support other organizations doing this work. But we're a bank, right? We're not in the extractive industry of oil and gas, and we don't have things going into um, you know, waste product going into landfills. So you know, there's, there's a certain amount of scope and impact that we can have in that arena. Uh, where we can really have an impact in arena is in our wheelhouse, you know, and we serve a lot of folks, but we think we serve business owners, their families and their employees particularly well. We have a deep expertise, they are passionate teams. And so the question for us is, what if we were to focus on serving women and minority business owners, you know, folks that have been historically had difficulty access in the financial system? And what if we can work within our system to find solutions that not only change the system for our bank, but maybe can permeate and have a great impact across the industry? And what would be the impact in our communities if we empower these individuals to grow companies um, within their communities? You know, so things like that is kind of, you know, that's another I, guidance that I'm seeing out there, um, which is more integrated, more sustainable. Um, and the last piece along those lines is looking at our partnerships with community partners. Is there a way that we can pioneer a new model there to go beyond the, the big photo, big check and photograph, you know, to, and beyond just sitting on a board to bring our talents, abilities, energy, and creativity to some of these partners to actually help them move the needle on their mission. So that's the kind of work that's ahead of us. And then of course, just, you know, the day-to-day -day job of, you know, taking great care of, uh, you know, our clients. Um, and then I'm sure as we go into do all the work I just described, you know, the next milestones or the next achievements will become clear for us. Well, that's certainly plenty <laughs> to, to share in addition to keeping the lights on. And it, you reminded me because you and I didn't get to talk about this, Neil, because I forgot about this overlap that Prosperity Maine, an organization that is um, working to empower immigrants to be successful in our community, you are, Andrew Scott and Bank is working closely on one of the initiatives that you talked about um, in Lewiston. And so it's an example of like, you're really, authentically, genuinely doing this work. So to your point of like, not wanting to do it just for the sake of, you know, being a part of a club or getting some kind of certification, like the ongoing work that it requires to, to really do the meaningful work to get, continue to get recertified and continue to um, work with the community to demonstrate your genuine authenticity in, in um, being this type of organization is cl clear among a number of different facets. So thank you so much for doing all that work in the community. Well, well thank you, Chad, but I would point out that's a great example is that, you know, for this is about having an impact in the world. And if you wanna have the biggest impact, you have to collaborate, right? It's a network effect, right? And the companies like Prosper, I mean, sorry, organizations like Prosperity Maine, which are just so impressive on so many levels. So, you know, for us to kind of, you know, to, to, to look, speak with them, engage them, um, get their guidance and say, how do we work together to have a bigger impact? And then hopefully, you know, eventually leverage other, you know, other relationships, other businesses, perhaps in our circle of influence who, who don't have the infrastructure that we do, they don't have a director of corporate impact, but say like, we'd like to piggyback on your network and to get involved with some of these companies. That would be the next level for us. How do we bring in other folks some of the consultants to say, hey, listen, would you meet with some of these companies? You know, we, we'll maybe be able to do some financing, but can you give some consulting? Uh, that's a really exciting piece. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, for some of you, I see lots of new names here, which is absolutely wonderful and, and so welcome to, to join us at any time, as I mentioned at the start of our time together. Some of this might feel potentially confusing <laughs> because 
it's a little bit of alphabet soup when you're learning about being a certified B Corp. And then we're talking about benefit corporations. And then you're at a conscious capitalism meeting and you're like, what is going on here? And what do all these things mean? Um, and what, what basically you can think about is this is all part of the benefit economy. It's a movement that we are all working on together. And there's just different iterations or different ways to approach the movement. Um, and they're all collabor in collaboration with each other and all sisters to each other is the way that I talk about it. So if, if you want to learn more, we are holding some informational sessions and Neil has been an awesome participant in those in the past where we just kind of deep dive into the B economy or what higher purpose means in conscious capitalism or some of the other tenets. So you'll if you join our mailing list or go to our website, you'll see those being offered. If you're curious about some of the language we've been using and just want to learn more because um, it can be a little bit confusing. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over for questions. Um, you see that Darren put in the chat our website um, so for the chapter. So you can definitely check that out. And then you're welcome to put questions in the chat. Um, and we'll try to manage those. And you're also very welcome to come off mute and ask Neil a question. And we'll just spend whatever time we have left till 4 o'clock answering as many questions as we can. So feel free to jump in um, and get off mute if you'd like to start. Oh, go ahead, Nate. You want to ask your question that you put in the chat? That'd be great. Yeah, if you don't mind. Um, you might be able to tell by the last name. ESOPs are obviously pretty near and dear to my heart. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm curious, in what ways do you see from a cultural perspective, um, sort of the certified B Corp overlap with ESOPs and which ways do you sort of see them as distinctly different? And obviously, I, I see Revision Energy and I know they're both. So um, maybe they can join, join in as well. But I'm just curious where you see that sort of distinction and where you see that overlap. Oh, it's interesting. And for, you know, for folks on the phone that don't know, it, ESOP employee stock going plan, which essentially is when a, typically in a sale of a company, the owners, the owners will transfer ownership over the employees and the employees kind of run the company. Um, you know, it's interesting. So we're, you know, obviously as a mutual bank, we don't have shareholders. So our stockholders kind of do that. So I think the ESOP is probably the ultimate manifestation of employee empowerment and employee stakeholder. And there's probably no doubt about that. I, but I'd leave it to fill a revision to talk about that more specifically, and, you know, a, a, having been an ESOP and a B Corp. But I, I think that, you know, it's one thing to say that, you know, an ESOP vests ownership into the employees and makes them a stakeholder. You could have that and you could still have an organization that is strictly um, focused on profit, right, without that. So I think they, they're, they're different approaches. One is a structure that makes you a stakeholder but it's also, are you recognizing other stakeholders? Are you recognizing environmental sustainability and other pieces? So they can layer on, as revision is done, they can layer very effectively. And Fortunat, if you wouldn't mind sharing any of your insight into that, because you'd have plenty, you're, you're welcome to do that. And then um, Erica has noted in the chat that this chapter will be having a panel on ESOPs on June 4th. <laughs> so you can go to the website and sign up for that too, but Fortunat, definitely add in whatever you'd like. Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo what Neil said. Um, I think they are two strongly complementary things. You know, as you say, um, employee ownership sort of collapses two of your primary stakeholders in, in your you know, shareholders and your employees. Um, and that is, uh, you know, that makes, in some ways that makes the sort of rest of the B Corp stuff easier because, um, you know, two of your, you know, five or six primary stakeholders are now sort of definitionally aligned. Um, but it is, um, you know, I would say there are, there's lots of employee owned companies who are still bastards and, um, <laughs> and there's lots of B Corps that are still closely held. Um, and so they're not, they're not, um, they're not entirely overlapping. Um, there, there is, for those who are interested in that, there is been some pretty interesting efforts around this uh, by an organization called 50 by 50 and the democracy collaborative down in, I think a, I have a Stern School at NYU um, around the power of employee ownership and um, you know mission-driven business in combination together. We did a pretty good report a couple of years ago. Happy to share if anyone's interested. Thanks, Fortuna. That's awesome. And Jeffrey asked a question about playbooks in the chat. And uh, Wendy, thank you to giving a link um, to a playbook from B Lab. So that's awesome. B Lab is kind of the mother company of the B Corp certification process and there is tons of information on their website as well about the certification process. It's also where you can find the business impact assessment or what's called the BIA that Neil mentioned earlier that you can do for free um, to, to sort of check out how the process works and see where you might stand in your organization. Again, using the model of 
I, I take the oath and I can prove it <laughs> as Neil described before. Uh, Jeffrey, did you have a question that you wanted to ask? Sorry, I was just taking the oath. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, thank you. Alrighty, that's spreading. Thanks for that. The resources is really what I was looking for. Okay. I, I appreciate it. Great. And also, Neil, thank you for your time. It's really been helpful um, to hear your journey with this. My, my right. pleasure. And Tara, thank you. Oh, yeah, of course. My absolute pleasure. What other questions do people have? I'm just going to check the chat quickly. Um, any other questions for Neil about his journey or what's next or any other general questions for the group? Because we have lots of experts here that can probably answer questions. This is Becky. I have a question. Um, thank you, Neil, so much. This was really inspiring. Um, we are in the process. We've submitted our B Corp. Um, assessment and we're in the queue for an auditor. Um, and one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is how we regularly communicate all of the metrics to the team. And I was curious if you have already have some rhythms of how you talk with your team or your board about all of the um, KPIs for B Corp. I, so great questions and I would say candidly no. So a little bit of the dog that caught the car. And, you know, that is part of the next phase for us is, you know, there's the annual B Corp. You know, we're looking at kind of integrating probably our annual reporting requirement with our, our formal annual report uh, as a bank. And we'll be looking at our KPIs. But that'll, candidly, that's hopefully be part of the work of the, the B team and the employee teams within their areas to look at not only the B Corp assessment, I will suggest that we will go broader. So we will certainly look at the, the B Lab questions of KPIs and areas, but we'll probably look at measurements from some of these other organizational organizations. Well, there's a sustainable accounting standards board that has a special set of metrics reporting measures for um, financial institutions. And there's a number of other um, reporting metrics out there that we may just kind of also incorporate into that, but that'll probably be part of the next phase for us. But I think, you know, I would kind of applaud your efforts to think about that transparency and how you get that cadence of, you know, accountability and sharing and recognize too, I think this is not going to be a linear process. I think in all humility, realize we will, you know, maybe take two steps forward, one step back. And although, you know, this is highly aspirational, we're an institution full of human beings. So I think the other thing is we, we will stumble in some regards. We will not do things perfectly and try to be transparent about that. And hopefully, you know, you're in the trust of your stakeholders that they recognize that and they stay with you as, on this journey. But so best of luck in your in the validation process. Thank you. Great question. Thank you, Becky. Any other uh, questions? I was just gonna make a quick point and, and Neil, thank you. That was an outstanding presentation. I was just gonna throw out the fact that uh, UNH's B Impact Clinic is a great way for companies to kind of test the waters. And I know, I think, yeah, you might have gone through that. I, I, uh, Becky, if I'm correct, you may be going through that as well. So, no, I know there are a few companies that have gone through that clinic and have ultimately gone on to certification. And on a twice a year basis, uh, Fiona Wilson at UNH and a group of her students are helping companies go through that the 200 questions about the impact certification or B Lab certification. So, so, so Todd, that, that's actually a great reference. We were not able to go through it because we couldn't get the timing to line up for us, but we did explore it. We were very impressed with them. And I, and I have spoken to other companies that have gone through it uh, as well, it, other companies in Maine. So that's a great reference because they have a tremendous amount of resources and you're, you're working with these students, which I, I've, I've heard is really compelling. Yeah. Yeah, I have a client that's actually, I'm glad you mentioned that too, Todd. I have a client that's going through that now with um, that, that group and has their own set of students. And they recently compared the students and the motivation and drive of the students to consultants and other um, really highly esteemed professionals and said the students were, were doing better. <laughs> so I think that's a good, good tribute to that program and the amount of resources and headway that you can make in really understanding where you're at on the BIA after you've done your own assessment to, to really help figure out um, what your situation is and get all your decks in a row, so to speak, to, to potentially apply, um, I think is a, another really important piece because internal resources are sometimes 
the second challenge to the board part that we already talked about, Neil, <laughs> just like, right. Right. as you said, people were doing this in addition to their regular jobs at Androscoggin Bank. Um, and I think that's generally the case for most organizations that are going after it. So that's another element to consider. Absolutely. Glad you mentioned that, Todd. What other questions do we have in our last few minutes? Um, hi, Neil. I just wanted to ask, I remember you saying like five years ago when you started talking about this, it was based on kind of nothing being certain in banking and that you wanted to focus on the people. So I'm curious five years later after COVID, like is there a more certainty about like where banking is going and how does that influence maybe the strategy changing for, for the B Core side of things going forward? I think the only thing say wherever it's going, it's going there faster. So I'll say that. And, and I think there's still less certainty. I think that we have all these dynamics happening within the industry. We have technology, we have these fintechs and now the big techs uh, coming into the space. So there's a lot of change. I think for us, you know, we're not being benchmarked against the bank down the street. We're getting benchmarked for the technology experience for Apple and Amazon. So in one sense, but through it all, I think we saw through PPP folks came and realized that, um, relationships matter even more, especially the local community. I think folks, you know, it, it came through to us and the, and the response we got from our clients. So we feel really confident. Again, I wouldn't say there's a tremendous amount more clarity of what's gonna happen in the industry. There's still a lot of consolidation and change, but I think we would say we are much more confident that we're on the right path. That if you focus on relationships, you know, within your community, you know, building that culture and then reflecting outside those deep relationships, no matter what happens, will be okay. One, because we think clients will value those relationships, especially our business clients value those relationships more than trying to do online uh, banking with you know, someone at the national level who may not answer the phone in a crisis, for example. Um, and I think also within our, you know, if we have a, a, a great culture and really talented high performing employees, they will be the source of the solutions to enable us to pivot to continue to be relevant to our clients going forward. That's really the, the secret source. It's the capability. This world's just going to uh, continue to change. That pace of change is going to accelerate. It's really the resiliency and the innovation, the capabilities of your, your human capital that become your competitive advantage going forward. So, you know, we're fully confident that we're going down the right path. It's a great question, though. And if you find out, let me know. <laughs> So any last burning questions before we wrap up today? It's been such an amazing conversation, Neil, and we had great participation from the group. Do we have one more or is everyone feeling full for this afternoon? Okay, well, it looks like everybody's full, Neil, because you've given us so much to think about and really appreciate the time and how articulate you were and thoughtful you were in answering the questions uh, from everybody. And I see lots of smiling faces and interesting people. I really appreciate that many of you have stayed on video because that's really nice that it makes it a, a little bit of a community, particularly for Neil as he can like look at people <laughs> rather than just me. So um, thank you for doing that too. And then also recognize some people can't do that but they've still been here and, and certainly their presence has been felt. So we really appreciate everybody's time this afternoon. We know that there's lots of competing priorities so, but, uh, particularly in Zoom world where um, you have to constantly make decisions about where you're gonna where your next screen is gonna be. Um, and so please continue to follow us and check out the website as Darren put in the chat and sign up for our future events if you're interested and you can reach out to me or Darren at any point for more information. And we'll put also our emails directly in the chat as well. So thank you very much and everybody have a great afternoon. Thanks all. Tara. Yes. Hi there. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thank you. I'm Ann Burrell from Androscoggin Bank. Hi, and, Ann. Hi. Hi. What a wonderful program. And thanks for uh, having me all on. I wondered, I was hoping that it had been recorded and I wondered if there were plans for our, my organization.